I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Welcome to Wonderfests and the Berkeley Public Library's presentation of Ask a Science Envoy. Um, my name is Tucker Hyatt. I am founding director of Wonderfest, the Bay Area beacon of science. I want to tell you about uh, Wonderfest's next upcoming event and, of course, uh, introduce our two speakers. But first, let's hear a word or two from Sierra Campagna, library at the Berkeley Public Li Librarian at the Berkeley Public Library. Tucker. Uh, hi, everybody. I just want to tell you about a couple things going on at the library. If you're really interested in science topics and want to learn more, we actually have a virtual program tomorrow night. I have to look at my phone here. It's called uh, Research Talks Popping the Science Bubble. And this is um, a talk with um, Berkeley grad students and postdocs. Um, I think tomorrow's might be on antibiotic resistance and uh, artificial food colors for kids. So it sounds pretty interesting. This is tomorrow night um, online at 530. You can find out more information on our web calendar at Berkeley Public Library. And then I also want to tell you about a new service that we have. Um, we have a free subscription to New York Times online. Now we also have access to New York Times uh, games and cooking. So definitely check it out on our website. And that's my plug. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra. Tell you about it. A next, a next, the next upcoming Wonderfest event that is a collaboration with the Berkeley Public Library. It is an Ask a Science Envoy event. It takes place on Thursday evening, May 11th, also via Zoom. Its title is Ask a Science Envoy, Poison Frogs and Quantum Chemistry. Please check out the event description at wonderfest.org. All right, before introducing tonight's speakers, I want to remind you about uh, how to put meaning and life into the initial title of tonight's presentation, Ask a Science Envoy. I encourage you to ask questions. Our first speaker is UC Berkeley biological anthropologist, Gustav Tavi Steinhardt. He will present primate behavior and microhabitat. All right, Tavi Steinhardt. He is a, a bear go, from Cal, go bears. Tavi earned a bachelor's degree in integrative studies at the University of Redlands and a master's degree in philosophy at the University of Chicago. Real, realizing that he preferred forests to libraries, Tavi did conservation work with Field Projects International before beginning PhD research with Cal anthropologist, Terence Deacon, who himself was a Wonderfest speaker not long ago. Please welcome biological anthropologist and Wonderfest science envoy, Javi Steinhardt. Thanks, Tucker. So let me say first that my attempt to escape libraries was utterly futile. Uh, it turns out when you do a PhD, you spend a lot of time in libraries no matter what you study. Uh, and I would not have gotten anywhere without the QL737.P9 primatology section of the biosciences library here. So there's no avoiding libraries and we're all better off for it. Uh, I'm speaking to you this evening from the Bioanthro Teaching Lab at UC Berkeley. And before I launch into my presentation, I want to introduce you to the study species, which is right here behind me. So in this teaching lab, we've got a bunch of samples of primates from all over the world. And my favorite display case is this one. These are the Amazonian primates. So you can see a howler monkey right here. We've got a squirrel monkey, which you might know from the Oakland Zoo. And then all the way at the bottom here, one of the smallest primates in the world, this is a tamarind. So as you can see, they're very small. And when we do health checks with them in the wild, they can just about fit in the palm of your hand. So they're a lot of fun to work with. They're very charismatic. They're very active. And I'm going to share my screen here so you can see what they look like in the flesh. All right. So. This is what tamarinds and their cousins, the marmosets, look like. So these are the tamarinds and marmosets. They together make up the group known as the Calatricidae, which uh, comes from the Greek words meaning beautiful hair. And you can see why they run the gamut from David Bowie all the way to David Bowie here. Uh, so as I say, very charismatic animals. Oh, and Sierra, you've got a charismatic animal for us as well. Um, 
So why do I study tamarins? It's not, well, it's not only because they're adorable and a lot of fun to watch. Uh, it's also because of this. So the problem here, of course, is deforestation. Um, this is, you know, you, you could rattle off a thousand statistics about this. The one that kind of brings it home for me is that we lose an area of Amazonian rainforest about the size of the city of Berkeley every day. So that's day after day, year after year. Uh, and, you know, we read about this bad news all the time when it comes to deforestation. There is some good news. And the good news is that this process can be reversed uh, with the right set of policies and given some time, the forest can kind of regenerate. It can heal very much the way that the body can heal a wound. And part of that healing process, as you may have guessed, is these little monkeys. They're really effective seed dispersers. They uh, essentially, the recent research shows that they play an important role in forests bouncing back after disturbance by humans. To understand how tamarins achieve this process of forest regeneration, it helps to know something about what deforestation actually looks like. So we get this image sometimes, including the image that I just showed you, this idea of deforestation as a kind of advancing tide, right? And almost like a line that's moving back from uh, into the, the interior of the forest. Deforestation doesn't really look like that. It, it looks more like what you're seeing here. So in this map, this is close to the field site where I work. And there's a couple of different kinds of damage here. So one is from gold mining. In these areas up near the river, you're seeing uh, basically, the trees have all been cleared away down to the soil level, and then the soil is being sifted. It's essentially like panning for gold, only at an industrial scale. So that's damage from gold mining. There's also agricultural damage, which you can see down in the southern part here, expanding out, kind of radiating out from the highway. So both of these are similar in that they create a patchwork. So it's not an advancing tide, but a kind of mosaic of, of deforestation. And that's a problem in a lot of ways. It creates, you might say, a, a death by a thousand cuts, so to speak. But it's also an opportunity because it means that even in the pretty disturbed areas, there are these patches of relatively mature forest, which can drive the regeneration once an area gets protected. So what do tamarins have to do with this? Well, what we've seen is that tamarins are able to move back and forth between these patches of mature forest and the nearby disturbed areas. And as they do so, they bring seeds that they're eating in those more mature areas and they poop them out in the disturbed areas. So they're depositing seeds along with some nice little packets of, uh, of fertilizer. So the insight here is tamarins are able to drive forest regeneration and if you want forest regeneration to work, it's important to conserve tamarind habitat in those patches of healthy forest. So a couple of research questions emerge from that insight. One is, what exactly is the habitat, the microhabitat of tamarinds? In other words, if we want their populations to be healthy so that they can drive this forest regeneration, what do we need to provide for them? What do we need to make sure they have in those patches of healthy forest? An important nuance to this, and this is really where my focus is, is how does their individual behavior contribute to that larger ecological story? In other words, the story I just told you about tamarins moving back and forth between mature forest and more disturbed areas, that's a behavioral story, right? That's not a static food web or something abstract. That's about individual monkeys and groups of monkeys making decisions minute by minute, hour by hour, where do we go? Where do we eat? Where do we sleep? Where do we poop? That's what drives this broader ecological change. All right, so how are we going to answer those questions? Well, obviously, we're going to have to go to the field. And this is the fun part of what I get to do. So my field work takes place in Peru. And if you're somewhat familiar with Peruvian geography. Uh, I work in the lowland forests about 100 miles east of the Andes. So this is Cusco right here. If you've been to Machu Picchu or dreamed about going to Machu Picchu, that's kind of up in this area. To get to the field station, it's a flight to Cusco, usually through Miami or someplace like that, and then about an hour flight to the city of Puerto Maldonado here along the river. And then there's about a six hour boat ride upriver 
to the confluence of two rivers where the Madre de Dios River and the Los Amigos River come together. And it creates a little patch of rainforest with a lot of different sort of microhabitats in it. So what you're seeing here over to the west, there's a big sort of uh, irregularly shaped palm swamp that's in a low lying area. There's a little bit of gold mining damage down alongside the river. The field station, I'm sorry, I should check. Can everyone see this, my little pointer here? Yes. Okay, good. So the field station is right here and it sits on what we call an alluvial terrace. That is an area of relatively high elevation forest where the rivers have cut away on either side and there's low lying forest on either side. One more thing that's really important here, right up here, very conspicuous is an abandoned airfield and that's gonna become really important in a second. So the field site looks like this when you arrive and this would be reason enough by itself to dedicate a PhD to this site. Um, but that's not the only reason that I work here. Uh, the Los Amigos Biological Station, in addition to being an extraordinarily beautiful place, also has some infrastructure that's really useful. So this cabin that you're seeing here is where I've lived for five out of the last six summers, um, right in, in this bunk right here on the right. So there's cabins, there's lab space, there's a kitchen, there's a library. There's a lot of really useful stuff at this field site. There's also a really healthy tamarind population. That's obviously why I go there is to study the tamarinds. And there's a variety of habitats because of that alluvial terrace and because of some of the history of the site, there's a variety of different habitats represented. So this is what you want if you're gonna study the habitat of tamarinds. You want lots of tamarinds and you want them moving around through lots of different habitats so you can see what difference it makes when they're in different areas. The tamarind population at this site consists of two species, uh, the emperor tamarind and the saddleback tamarind. The emperor tamarind is one of the more uh, dramatic looking monkeys with this big mustache. Uh, studying two species at the same time is, is frustrating in some ways because it means that your sample sizes are inevitably half as big as they should be. You're splitting your effort between two species. It's also really nice because it means if I get the same results for both species, that's great. That's corroboration of my findings. If I get different results for the two species, that's also great. That means, you know, I can ask what's the difference that makes the difference between these two species. So in addition to the healthy tamarind population, the other advantage of this site is that it's a mosaic of different habitats. And the details here don't really matter, but you can just tell from this map that there's a lot of different habitats all kind of mixed in together. And there are a couple of habitat types that are particularly important for my work. So one I've already mentioned is these clear cut areas. So one is the abandoned airfield up here. The other is the field station itself, which is clear cut so that we can use it. The airfield was abandoned in about 2006. So we've been able over that time, since the area was protected, to basically use it as a kind of field experiment. We can use this airfield to see what happens to a clear cut area over time when it becomes protected. And I can say in just the years that I've been there, I've seen it dramatically change. Um, if you look over here, this is a photo from about 2017. So you can see the clear cut areas down on the right. There's an area of bamboo that's growing really, really quickly. This is now more or less taken over the whole airfield. And then further into the left, you're seeing tall trees. This is the relatively undisturbed forest right on the edge of the airfield. A second habitat type that's really important is primary forest. So primary forest is the healthy forest. This is where you know, if you imagine a rainforest with super tall trees with these beautiful buttress roots, that kind of imagery, that's primary forest. That's an old, healthy forest. A third thing that's really important here is edge effects. So when you clear cut an area, obviously you're completely changing the plant community in that area, but it's not just in that area. So if you imagine sort of continuous canopy, okay, now I get rid of the canopy in one area. Well, now the sunlight is gonna penetrate to the forest floor well into the interior of the forest in places where it wasn't before. That's gonna change the temperature, it's gonna change the humidity, the plant community, the insects, the birds, the primates, everything is gonna change in that forest edge region. And what we now know is that those edge effects can cascade back into the interior of the forest as much as half a mile. 
So even half a mile back, you're seeing differences in the animal communities, differences in tree mortality, all kinds of things that are different because of these cascading edge effects. All right, so we've got a bunch of research questions. We've got a study system, a place to study the animals. We've got animals running around everywhere. What's the next thing we need? Well, we need a method. And the method that I use is something called distribution analysis, which basic, basically says, all right, if something is here, 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 and here, why is it not here, 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 and here? There are three steps to distribution analysis. The first is to map out the environment. So you take as much data as you can possibly get about the environment, satellite images, infrared images, plant maps, soil chemistry, whatever you can get. You map all that stuff out. And then you observe where is the organism in question. Put geo points on that stack of maps. And then you use a statistical technique, these days it's machine learning, to kind of drill down through that whole stack of maps and extract values that tell you, okay, what is it that make these areas different from these other areas where we didn't see the animal? And there's a little bit of the wrinkle to the way that I do that third step, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So the first step here is mapping the environment. And I'm really lucky in terms of the maps that I have. I've uh, worked with some amazing collaborators. Planet Labs in San Francisco donated some high resolution uh, infrared and satellite imagery. There's years and years of maps that have been done by the nonprofit organization that runs the field site. So I've gotten to use those. I've made a few of them myself. Uh, the coolest thing I've gotten is a LIDAR scan. So LIDAR, you may be familiar with, is a laser scanning technology that gives you a three-dimensional uh, model of an environment. And this is what my field site looks like in LIDAR. So you can imagine the first time that I saw this, I just about lost my mind. Um, there's a ton of data that you can derive from something like this. I can see canopy height, the density of the vegetation at different levels of the understory, the variation, which kind of tells me where there are gaps in the forest, dozens and dozens of different things uh, that I'm able to derive from this map, which was created not by me, but by a team out of the University of Florida that uh, was kind enough to share it with me. So we've got all these maps. Now this is the part that, that I'm really more involved in is the actual observation of the animals themselves. So to give you a sense of what that looks like, this is a team leaving in the morning to go locate some monkeys. Looks like we're getting a little bit of a late start. Normally we would leave before dawn, but we're going out and we're gonna find the monkeys. We're gonna use a handheld GPS to track where we go with them. And we're just gonna stay with them all day. We're gonna take notes on every single thing that they do, what they eat, who they socialize with, any ecological interactions that we see. We're just gonna take notes on all of that stuff as we spend our time with them through the whole day. So at the end of the day, we're gonna get something that looks a little bit like this, where you know we pick them up at the sleep tree early in the morning. They went out, they had breakfast, they ran around a little while, found another foraging tree. Maybe they ran over here, they saw a raptor, they freaked out, they mucked around in this area for a little while and eventually went to sleep. So this is a kind of day in the life of, in this case, a saddleback tamarind family. So that's the observations. We're layering those over the maps and then we're gonna do the analysis. Now, when it comes to the analysis, the details here don't really matter. It's a machine learning algorithm, and it spits out a ton of useful information that basically characterizes, okay, what is the type of forest that seems to be suitable for this organism, right? What are the characteristics of forest that make them found in this area rather than in this area? And we can then take that information and reproject it onto the, the area where we did the study so that the algorithm is basically saying, you may or may not have seen animals in this area, let's say, but you've seen them in areas that are generally similar, that have similar kinds of characteristics. So that's really helpful because we're so limited in terms of how much data we can collect, right? We can only follow one family at a time. There's dozens of families in the forest. So by following that one family and getting really detailed data on what they do, we're able to get a sense of sort of what's appropriate habitat for animals in other parts of the study site. Now I mentioned there's a wrinkle in the way that I do this. And the wrinkle is traditional distribution analysis is gonna be based on where did you see the animals? Because in the case of most animals, that's all you can really get. You get a camera trap, you get a bird that you caught in a mist net in this area versus this other area. 
With primates, we're able to do something a little bit different, which is follow them all day and get incredible detail on their behavior. It's a really difficult thing to do with something like a bird that's just going to fly away and you're not going to be able to track it. You might be able to put a GPS collar on it or something, but you can't actually be with it all day the way we can with the primates. So what we're able to do with primates is separate out these presence points into different behaviors, essentially saying, OK, this is the kind of forest where we tend to see the animals, but are they actually doing anything there or are they just passing through? Where are they actually sitting and eating? Where are they going to sleep? What are the forests that they're actually interacting with for the critical parts of their life history? So I run separate analyses for different behaviors in the different species, and you get results that look a little bit like this. So a couple of things kind of jump out here. One is that the presence map looks very different from these behaviorally sensitive maps. So that's not terribly surprising, uh, but it does kind of confirm our assumption that where the animals are is different from where they're eating and where they're sleeping. So essentially what you see in these maps on the left is, okay, there's tamarins all over the place. Wherever you go in this study area, you're gonna find tamarins. That's not a surprise. That's why I'm there in the first place. But when you break it out into behaviors, it turns out that they are actually pretty picky about where they go for these behaviors that really matter. Looking at the individual behaviors here, there are a couple of interesting dynamics going on, and you'll see them if I put them up next to the habitat map that I showed you before. So one thing that's really conspicuous here is notice the way the emperor tamarins love eating in that buffer zone, that edge right around the deforestation. They really, really want to eat there. The saddleback tamarins to some extent are eating in the buffer area, but they're absolutely avoiding the damaged area itself, the actual former airfield. There's nothing for them to eat there. And they do seem to be eating in this area out along the ridge, which if you compare it to this map, that's mostly primary forest. Another very conspicuous uh, tendency that you see in the sleep tree maps is the emperor tamarins are absolutely avoiding primary forest when it's time to go to sleep. They will not sleep there. The saddleback tamarins are almost the opposite. They really like these areas to sleep and they're avoiding the more damaged areas for sleep. So those are just a handful of the things that we're able to learn from these maps. Uh, we're basically able to generate profiles, habitat profiles of these animals in much greater detail than we would if all we could see was they're here, they're here, they're here, right? Paying attention to behavior gives us some really important nuances. And from these more detailed habitat profiles, we're able to ask a new set of questions about the habitat. So for example, uh, if I look at comparing these two species, one hypothesis would be, okay, well, the emperor tamarins seem to be spending a lot more time in the buffer zones and a lot less time in the primary forest. So maybe they're better seed dispersers. They're spending time in the areas where we want them to be sp spending time. On the other hand, neither of these species seems to be foraging in the really mature primary forest. So it may be that the seeds they're dispersing are really great for the initial forest recovery, sort of getting a forest back from nothing, but it might be that that transition from second growth forest into a healthier, more mature primary forest is gonna be driven by some other seed disperser. These are totally hypothetical. These are things that we're gonna be collecting data on over the coming years. But like any scientific project, we sort of end with more questions than we started with. And hopefully there are questions that we could not have even framed before doing the analysis. So that's the sort of value of this, what is really exploratory work, um, just getting drilling down into as much detail as we can about these animals' lives. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions from you. Tavi, thank you. I've got a few questions for you. First, thank you for that presentation. Uh, Stuart, there you are. Stuart Usum is going to ask a question. Do you want me to read it, Stuart? Were there any forest fires in the area during your five to six years there, Tavi? How did the fire affect the tamarins? Yeah, um, there weren't any forest fires in this area. The fires were, were further south and, uh, and east in the area, I, I guess it was maybe around 2018, that there were really bad Amazonian fires. Um, this area is further away from a lot of the really big clear cutting. So forest fires are more common in areas that have been 
completely cut away for things like cattle ranches, right? Re that are really big areas of completely denuded of trees. What we tend to get are smaller farms, um, little banana, you know, artisanal banana plantations, um, gold mines, things like that, that, that don't clear out a whole forest and are a little bit less susceptible to fire. What we do get that surprises people is um, cold weather. We get extremely cold weather in this part of the Amazon because of deforestation further south. So there is this, this weather phenomenon called a friaje, which is basically cold air coming up from Patagonia and the Andes um, and blowing into the Amazon rainforest. Years ago, those would stop much further south. Now the southern forests are going away. The friajes are getting further and further north, and they're actually the primary cause of mortality in this population of primates is freezing uh, in friajes. So the deforestation the sort of large scale deforestation down into Brazil is affecting us, um, but not so much because the fires are actually reaching us. Thank you, Tavi. Thank you for the question, Stuart. All right, let me fire one here. You're using the, the word forest here repeatedly, Tavi, and I, I'm familiar with redwood forests locally, but when I saw the even admittedly beautiful picture you showed us first, I was thinking jungle. Do experts like you distinguish the word jungle from forest? Yeah, we don't really use the word jungle. Um, it's, uh, it's it, it comes from Hindi, I think, or maybe Sanskrit and just means wild. Um, so jungle tends to conjure images of a, a lot of vines, right, where you have to machete your way through everything. That is particularly sort of a second growth phenomenon. That's a forest that's relatively young. And so everything is growing really quickly. In a mature rainforest, it doesn't really feel like a jungle because all the biomass is way up in the canopy. So the ground level is relatively clear. So the image that I think people have of, of a rainforest or a jungle uh, tends to be a, a, you know, a very particular kind of microhabitat that we see. Um, we usually use forest or rainforest to describe the general phenomenon of a place that has a bunch of trees in it. Um, and then if I'm talking to another person working at the field station, we might say, you know, are you in the terra firme forest, the, the high elevation forest or the flooded forest near the river? Are you in palm swamp, primary versus secondary forest? Um, but jungle is not a word that's used a whole lot by rainforest ecologists. All right. And in my life, henceforth, it'll be forest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tavi. Also, you use the term tamarind family. Can you tell us anything about this family structure? What is it? What is a tamarind family and how does it behave? Yeah, there's so there's a whole other half hour presentation I could give you just on their family behavior. Um, they're really, really interesting. So they have what's called a cooperatively polyandrous system. So that's a system where you have a single breeding female, multiple breeding males, and all of the males are cooperating in care of the offspring. So it's exactly the opposite of what you might imagine from like a silverback gorilla, right, with the dominant male and his harem of females. This is a dominant female with a, a harem of males. Um, it creates all kinds of interesting social dynamics. It, it makes the females very aggressive with each other. The males tend to be pretty cooperative. They're pretty chill. Uh, exactly the opposite, again, of like a baboon where the, or a gorilla where the males are the ones that are really kind of psychotic. Um, they're also they're just incredibly cooperative groups. One of the reasons why I initially got interested in them is because they do things that humans do, like sharing food. Uh, they have incredibly flexible mating systems. They're generally polyandrous, but they can do whatever. They're monogamous sometimes when that works. They're non-monogamous when that works. So they have this incredible flexibility and cooperation uh, that has made them a, a real interest for scientists for a long time. Uh, and there's kind of there's like two angles on why are you into tamarinds and one is the conservation angle and one is the socioecology angle. Um, I find both of them really interesting and I just happened to be talking about conservation today. Got it. All right, Tavi, thank you very much. We may have time for more questions, but I have a feeling that we should move on under the sea. Uh, let me introduce our second speaker for tonight. She is marine biologist from Stanford, Sienna Tillman. She'll pre present a unique study, a unique case study in fish behavior. Sienna earned her Bachelor of Science degree in marine biology at UC Santa Cruz, go slugs. Now Sienna is a third year PhD student at Stanford where she does research with Professor Fiorenza Micheli 
at Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey. Sienna is a Stanford Edge Fellow and just this year earned an NSF grant graduate research fellowship. Please welcome marine biologist and Wonderfest Science Envoy, Sienna Tillman. Um, so what's really cool about this event is that Tavi and I kind of are, are interested in similar things. He just works terrestrially and, and I work in marine environments. And so I think Tavi's done a really good job of, of sort of showing you through monkeys why it can be important to study animal behavior and why that matters for conservation. And I'm gonna try and, and convince you of a similar thing for the marine environment using fin. So just like Tavi was talking about monkeys being individuals making decisions, I'd like to point out before we get started that fish do the same things. I think it's a bit easier for us as humans to relate to monkeys because we can look at them and see similarities. We can look at their social behaviors and see similarities, even the things that they eat and see similarities to ourselves. And with animals that are a little bit different from us, like fishes, that can be a little bit harder. But what I hope we can all take from this is that we can relate to fishes as, as animals that are individuals that do make decisions based on how they perceive their environment. And maybe if we relate to different kinds of animals a little bit more, I think we can care a little bit more about what they do and, and how we preserve, preserve them. So going forward today, I'm gonna to show you some preliminary results from a study that we've done on fishes and sort of convince you that they are changing their behavior based on their environment. So the same way if I dropped you all in, in Las Vegas, you might make different choices than you would make if I dropped you in somewhere like Yosemite, right? So your environment sort of informs the way you move, the way you behave and the choices you make. And the same is true for monkeys, the same is true for fishes. So just to reiterate, I wasn't sure how much of an introduction I would get. It was lovely though, Tucker. Um, I am Sienna, it's pronounced just like the minivan. So I hope the spelling isn't intimidating. And I am a second year PhD student at Stanford. I'm stationed at Hopkins, the Marine Station down in Monterey. So if any of you have ever been to that aquarium, I'm right next door. If you haven't, you absolutely should. It's glorious. Um, and I did graduate from UC Santa Cruz. I'm a banana slug. If anyone else is a banana slug, shout out. If not, that's okay too. Um, and based on the work I've done in my past, the work I'm doing now, and sort of the questions I'm interested in studying in the future, I would consider myself a marine community ecologist. And so some of you might be wondering what that term community ecologist means or, or how I would define that. And I would say a community ecologist is someone who asks a certain type of question. And usually those questions are coming from the perspective of a broader lens of looking at a whole community and the environment and how those things interact with each other rather than looking at an individual organism or just one species. So these questions can range from how the environment changes and how that affects the way different species or different organisms behave or interact. It can also be questions about how different organisms, different species interact with each other, whether those be predatory interactions or symbiotic interactions where they're both helping each other out etc. And sometimes these questions address functional roles, so understanding what job an organism plays in its community. So whether it's an herbivore or a corallivore, meaning that it eats coral, or a piscivore, meaning that it's a fish that eats other fish, right? So really thinking about what jobs each species can do in their community and going off of that, understanding cascading effects. And Tavi touched on this a little bit where we're thinking about if you remove an organism that plays a certain role in the community, what does that do to the overall community structure and the way it functions? And so I'm someone who really likes to ask those kinds of broad questions. And something that really excites me is, is biodiversity. So for the sake of, of this talk, I'll be defining biodiversity as species richness, which is just to say, habitats that have a lot of different kinds of species that inhabit it, that inhabit them. And so I really like to ask these kinds of broad questions in biodiverse environments, because the more species there are, sometimes the more complex and dynamic these, these answers or these connections can be. And so for today's talk, I'll be talking about coral reefs, which I think we're all somewhat familiar with, but biodiverse environments like this are throughout the 
tropical near shore. And that's where I do most of my work. And so with coral reefs, of course, they house up to a quarter of our known ocean species. And so that's a huge amount of biodiversity. And those are huge biodiversity hotspots. So I like to sort of untangle how the community functions in those settings. Um, we're not going to talk about seagrasses and mangroves today, but this is just a shout out because I also am doing some work on some of those ecosystems that are near shore and tropical and deeply biodiverse. And these ecosystems tend to be nursery systems for coral reefs. So juvenile fish and invertebrates will settle there until they're big and strong enough to hold their spot on the reefs. So these are, are systems that I think are a little bit underrepresented in the science. So I just wanted to shout them out. But for this talk, I'll be talking about a coral reef environment. And to be specific, I'll be talking about the Chagos. So the Chagos is an archipelago as pictured here that's east of Africa in the ocean. And it's full of coral reefs. It's mostly uninhabited, which means that there's not a whole lot of direct human impact. And it's also really special in that when it comes to reefs across the world, the Chagos has the highest number of fish abundance anywhere. It's, it's really unmatched and it's sort of this outlier when it comes to coral reefs. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's, it's pretty untouched by at least direct human impact. And so just to orient you a little bit further, um, this is sort of a map of the archipelago, the whole archipelago. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor at all. Can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. So the specific sites in the archipelago that I'll be talking about today are this atoll right here, and it's called Peros Banos Atoll, and Salomon Islands right here. And those are, are sort of where we've collected our data from, just to orient you. And close up of those atolls so you can understand sort of the shape of the reefs and, and what it's looking like, get you a bit of a picture in your mind. And so because these are really unique environments that have such a high abundance of fish, it gives a really unique opportunity to study how the density of fish affects behavior, affects the way the community functions. So we went into this wanting to know how does the density of fish affect fish behavior. Now, of course, I've just pointed out that I'm really interested in very biodiverse environments and, and the Chagos is that. So to answer a question this broad would be more than any one person could really do because there are so many species. So what we had to do was narrow it down and we decided to focus specifically on grazing fish species. So to the left is a surgeon fish, a type of surgeon fish. Surgeons are a family of fish and there are many different variations. And on the right is a parrot fish, again, a family of fish, many different variations. They're obviously visually gorgeous, but more than that, grazers are deeply important to coral reef habitats. And one of the reasons they are so important is because they maintain the health of the coral themselves. So there's a lot of previous study that suggests that algal growth is not good for, for the coral animal because it creates a competitor for sunlight and corals need to photosynthesize. But more than that, algae can attract really harmful bacteria that can lead to coral disease. So when you have a healthy population of grazers, such as these in your coral reef environment, you're more likely to have healthy coral. Uh, and since coral are the foundation species for this 25% of ocean organisms that rely on, on coral reef habitat, it's really important that they stay healthy and grazers play a major role in that. So we really wanted to look at how grazing behavior changes with the density of fish. And another reason we chose grazers is because of their positionality on the food chain. So of course, at the bottom of your food chain, you have your primary producers like algae and seaweed. And these are things that are photosynthesizing and, and getting their energy from, from sunlight. But surgeon fish like dory, which is another uh, variation of surgeon fish, if you're familiar with Finding Nemo, uh, this is a powder blue surgeon fish. Um, but surgeon fish and parrotfish grazers, like the one pictured here, are really important for turning over that energy that is created through sunlight by primary producers and making it available to other higher levels of the food chain. So without that link in the chain, all these other more sometimes charismatic, bigger fish that we, we sometimes think about would not have any way to access that pool of energy. So that's another reason that we chose grazers because they're really important. And just to kind of walk you up some of the broader community structure, 
um, some of our omnivorous fish or angelfish or triggerfish, and that's a triggerfish picture here. And these are fish that are eating both our primary producers, our algae, our seaweed, but also small invertebrates, a lot of times snails and crabs. So they're kind of doing double duty. And then you have primary predators like the goatfish pictured here. Um, and these are also mostly eating small invertebrates. And then as you go further up the food chain, you have secondary predators like, like jacks. And these are fish that are piscivorous, meaning they're gonna eat other smaller fish. And then of course, when you get to the top, you have your apex predators. And these are things like sharks that we're all familiar with, that we all get excited about, that we dedicate a whole week to during July, uh, if you tune in. And as incredible and beautiful and charismatic as these animals are, it's important to remember that without these smaller grazers that really link that energy transfer in the food chain, we don't have these beautiful big predators. So it's really important to understand where they're at health-wise. Mm -hmm. So going into this work in the Chagos, we were thinking about what we were expecting to see. So we wanna know how the density of fish affects the way that grazers behave. So what did we expect to happen? Well, pretty simply put, we expected if there are more grazers, there's probably more grazing. And there's some pretty intuitive logic behind that, which is essentially, if you have a family of seven and a family of three, you would expect that the family of, of seven can eat more than the family of three can, right? So it, it's essentially that logic that propels us thinking, okay, more grazers will mean more grazing, but also there's previous letter, literature in other sites, coral reef sites, that suggest that the more grazer you the grazers you have, the more grazing there is, the less algae there is, the healthier the corals are, right? So we're sort of looking for that dynamic in the Chagos where fish abundance is significantly different than it is anywhere else. And so in order for us to do that, we, via scuba, um, members of my lab deployed these GoPro cameras out into the water at multiple sites. So because we don't have um, such complex maps and, and working in the marine world kind of limits the way you can use technology, we kind of just put out GoPros for hours at a time, go back later and collect them and then analyze the footage for, for the grazing behavior that we're looking for. So this particular video is really fun because you get to see an octopus and a grouper sort of aiding each other in feeding for small invertebrates. Um, this is something that they're known to do. It's been captured a couple times. It's not well studied, but it's super interesting that we caught it with our GoPro. Um, I promise you most of the videos are not this interesting. So I pulled out this clip just from you, just for you guys, for from hours and hours of footage. Um, and this is beautiful footage. Watching reef fish come by and swim for hours at a time can be relaxing until you have to identify each of them and then count how many bites each of them makes and do that for hours and hours and hours on end. And that's the extremely high tech way that we process this data was just sitting by our laptops and waiting for fish to bite and, and writing down when they did, right? So this was a fun little treat to be able to see this and I'm glad I could show it to you. Uh, but most of the videos are not this exciting and, and it did get old pretty quickly, but I am very glad that we did go through all that data because we found some pretty cool patterns. So I'm just gonna show you guys some preliminary results. There's still a lot more work to do on this because I am only in my second year. Um, but what I'm showing you here is just one site, and I decided just to show one because they're all pretty much similar in terms of community composition, and this way it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. But from this site, on the vertical y-axis, you're getting number of fish, so just the total number of fish that, that we marked down that bit the substrate, and then each color refers to a different type of fish or a different fish family. And so what the arrow points at there is surgeon fish, which is that huge blue block. And so what you can see is there's a really healthy grazer community here in the Chagos. And there are a lot of grazers. Most of them are within the surgeon fish family. There's of course different types, but there's a lot of surgeon fish. And so that was really interesting to us. And, and we wanted to see how surgeon fish densities sort of affected the way that they graze, the way that they eat. And so for this plot on the y-axis, it's cut off a little bit, but what you're getting is the average number of bites per individual surgeon fish. So how many times 
times each fish at a site would bite essentially on average. And then the x-axis is the total number of surgeon fish at a site. So as you move to the right, the number increases. And so what you can kind of see here is a bit of a positive relationship that suggests, okay, the more surgeon fish there are, the more they each eat. And that isn't that surprising because we know that a lot like Tavi's monkeys, surgeon fish are a little bit social in the, the way that they graze and they tend to eat more when they're in groups. So that's something that we expected. And it's also in line with the idea that, okay, if there are more grazers, we expect more grazing, right? But that's just counting the surgeon fish. So we wanted to know, okay, what happens to grazing behavior when we account for all the other kinds of fish that are present in the Chagos? And so what you see here is a similar chart, but this time on the y-axis, it's still the average number of bites per individual at a site, individual surgeon fish at a site. And then on the x-axis, it's the total number of fish, regardless of what family or what kind of fish it is. And so what you see is kind of an inversion of that relationship where now, as the total number of fish increases, surgeon fish are grazing less, they're eating less algae. And so this could suggest a couple of things. It could suggest some kind of territoriality that's happening with, with other families of fish that are discouraging surgeon fish from eating. It could point to a limitation of resources, which, which creates more competition between different species, different fish species or different fish types. And so that's really interesting because that's kind of opposite of what we expected to see. And that's not what we really see on a lot of other reefs. Um, and to take this even further, we plotted just grazers themselves, since that's what we were focusing on. And so on the y-axis, vertically, you have the average number of bites per individual grazer. So this time, it's not just surgeon fish, but it's also other kinds of grazers, like the parrotfish that I showed you before. And then our x-axis is the total number of grazers, so not counting any omnivores or uh, piscivorous fish or, or sharks or anything like that. And we still see this, this negative relationship that shows that as the number of grazers goes up in the Chagos, the amount that they're grazing goes down, which is again, the opposite of what we expected. And it suggests that there might be some level of competition that's happening, that's driving the behavior in a different way than we see on other reefs that have less fish abundance. And so if you're like me in any way, you probably think that intrinsically that's pretty cool. Um, but if you're struggling to understand or see why we would care, um, I can provide you with some reasons. So one being because the Chagos is so untouched, it's pretty uninhabited and there's not a whole lot of direct human impact, we can use it as a model system and we can see what the coral reef communities are behaving like there and compare that to what we see in other places to see what we might be losing in other places, what might be missing in other places, what's different and how that might relate to human interaction. It's also important because we can use behavior as a metric for health. And I think Tavi really touched on this when he talked about restoring forests through the movements and the dispersion of, of his monkeys, right? So in the same way, we can use grazers as a metric for health because they're already so indicative of how healthy coral reef ecosystems are. But if we can study their behavior in a healthy context like the Jagos, we can start to, to know what we would look for as a metric of health in other systems and sort of apply that measure. And of course, in a more broad sense, in a conservation sense, that's really important when we think about decision making. Because one thing that a lot of us agree on at this point is that humans have a mostly negative impact on our natural world and that it's time that we work towards preservation and conservation. And a lot of people are working towards legislation for that, have come up with restrictions to sort of protect our natural e ecosystems. But sometimes we know that we wanna protect, but we don't know what we want the outcome to be. We don't know what the goal is. We don't know how to say, yes, we've done it, this has worked. And so if we can see what healthy communities behave like, how they function, and start to use that as a metric for what health looks like in other places, it can really inform what our goals are when we start thinking about legislation and decision making. So basically the further that we study fish behavior, the decisions that fish are making, the better we can make our own decisions 
and make sure that we're providing for ourselves in a sustainable way. So I'll, I'll stop there and I would love to take any of your questions if you have them. Thank you, Sienna. We yeah. do have a question for you from Stuart, our first questioner last time. Stuart, I'll again assume you're going to be lower profile this time than usual. So I'll ask the question, but please, if you're willing to, fire away yourself. I'm here, I'm here. All right, good. Thank you, uh, enjoyed both talks very much. Very eye-opening and mind-expanding. Um, can you tell me, uh, did anyone suggest or did you think of possibly using um, uh, image recognition to uh, and training it to um, to count and identify the fishes and, and even their bites? Thank you. Yeah, um, that is definitely something I've talked about a few times and something that I was really excited about initially because I thought I wouldn't have to sit through hours of footage to watch fish bites. Um, the tough part about that is a couple things. One being that when we're talking about fish identification, before you can get the machine to accurately do it for you, you have to sort of manually do it on a lot of data anyway. So at that point, it, it's not much help, but also the fact that it's really hard to teach a machine to identify a behavior rather than a look, right? So to get the machine to say, this is what biting looks like can be difficult because a lot of times it's subjective, right? So when you look at those videos, sometimes fish are biting behind rocks where you can't really see their mouths, but you can tell by the way they move their bodies that they're biting something. So there's, there's a lot of subjectivity that's really hard to train a computer to do um, accurately. So I definitely thought about it. I would be open to any suggestions if, if people are well-versed in ways to make that happen. But those are some of the major issues that, that we ran into when we were exploring that option. Thanks for explaining, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for the question, Stuart. Uh, Sienna, let me ask you if you have been able to or hope to be able to go to the Chagos Archipelago, uh, archipelago yourself. Um, I haven't been able to. Um, this is data that I am helping a lab mate with. My other chapters of my work are based in Palau and I have been to Palau. Um, and so that's an island in Micronesia. Um, it's about a 32 hour journey from, from Monterey. Wow. Um, and I was there for a month the last November and, and did some diving and some field work there. And, and that's where I'll be working more with some seagrasses in, in addition to coral reefs. Um, but that's some data that I'm still working on getting. And so this is, this is since I'm only in my second year, what I have to process now. Um, I don't see myself going to the Chagos, but Palau is, is similarly impressive, not in terms of fish abundance, but in the sense that it's one of the most biodiverse uh, reef systems in the world. So the Chagos is, is exemplary in that it has unmatched levels of fish abundance and Palau is exemplary in that it has unmatched levels of biodiversity. So I think those are both really cool sites to explore. And because I'm so excited about biodiversity, Palau is, is sort of what I'm leaning towards personally as my study site. And I'm also really interested in the social impact of, of degrading environments. And because there's more of a human interaction in Palau, that's something I'll be able to, to dip a toe in as well when, when I continue to do work there. All right, I see another question here from Stuart, but let me just continue with the question about geography here. Since you are promoting, all thoughtful marine scientists are promoting protection of various areas of, of the ocean, which governmental body should we turn to protect the, the, the Chagos or, or Palau? Under what country do, are they controlled? Yeah, that's that's difficult. The Chagos is a lot more complicated than than Palau is, um, because there's there's less inhabitants there. It's it's a little bit uncertain who whose territory it is, um, and it, it, it's also a little, I think, strange as far as who's allowed access to that environment. Because you would think it's close to Africa, it's pretty close to India. You would think that they're the ones who are most frequently visiting or, or doing research there. And that's not really the case. So there's a lot of, of confusion. And, and I think that's still kind of uncertain. But for Palau, they are their own republic. They are their own nation. And one thing that's really interesting about Palau is if you're not Palau and you're not even allowed to own land there, 
So they're very self-governed and they have a history of stewardship over their natural environments. They have a history of sustainable use. And so that's something that's really important to them. So they work really closely with local researchers and, and some of my collaborators on trying to figure out, okay, what are we learning from these studies and, and what are sort of the best ways to employ protection or what restrictions work and, and which ones don't. And so I think another reason why I'm a little bit more interested in Palau is because of that cooperation, but also because of, of the locally driven sort of research questions. And so my job is sort of just to help them with the resources that I have to sort of answer questions that are vital for, for them moving forward. And, and so that's sort of what's going on in Palau. Thanks, Sienna. All right, yeah. Stuart, you have two questions. Please fire away. Yes, yes. Got my uh, got my uh, imagination going. Um, so, um, did you observe human pollution um, in in that area? And um, do you think that that uh, affected uh, the fish behavior, or feeding behavior, other behavior uh, that was that you were trying to monitor and and measure? Yeah, for sure. That's a a great question. Um, the Chego specifically is really uh, pristine, just because not a lot of people are are given access to it. It's kind of remote. It's hard to get to. And there's not people that really live there. So there's not a whole lot of human pollution. But what I will say is the indirect effects of climate change aren't really escapable, right? So because coral reefs are sensitive to, to changes in temperature and, and the like, there are human impacts that affect the reefs. And, and that can be seen in, in leaching events when we reach really warm temperatures. And those do happen in the Chagos. But as far as direct pollution from mining or from oil spills or from like sewage outlets, common ways that we kind of directly pollute the environment, that's that's less of an issue in the Chagos just because it's so remote and there's not really a human population that's living there. Mm -hmm. Any uh, change in the uh, uh, as, 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 ocean acidity uh, there? Right, right, right. Um, yes. It's not to the level that yet that we have to worry about whether calcifying organisms can survive. And just as some background, because I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with, with ocean acidification, um, some of that carbon is held within our oceans. And the more that we carbonate our oceans, the more acidic it becomes. So the lower pH is, and that makes it hard for any shell building or um, calcified organisms to, to sort of build their shells without it starting to dissolve. And, and that can really um, put a, take a toll on how much energy they need to survive and how much energy they use building shells. So specifically for coral reefs, corals build their, their bone structure with calcium carbonate. So this directly would affect them. Um, but to go back to your question, in, in the Chagos, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that Ocean acidification is one of the main stressors, but again, the indirect effects of, of human climate change are really inescapable at this point. So if we continue along the path that we're on, eventually we would expect that it gets there. And so this pristine kind of model system would no longer be an image of, of what a healthy community would look like. And, and we would kind of lose the ability to, to use it as a baseline, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sure, the one big ocean. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, you were mentioning Palau. Uh, have you considered uh, the Galapagos Islands uh, and their great biodiversity um, combined with uh, the, the large amount of human tourism there and the protected status of it being an Ecuadorian national park? Absolutely. Um, it, it's always been a dream of mine to go to the Galapagos. And in fact, there is another lab at Hopkins Marine Station where, where I am right now. Well, not physically right now, but where I work right now. Um, and they work on tuna and sharks and, and large pelagic fish. And they're actually in a couple of days going on a trip to the Galapagos and doing some work down there. Um, so I have thought about it. I think my lab that I'm in right now has really strong collaborative collect co connection with Palau. We've been working with the locals there for a really long time. So I think that for me right now makes a little bit more sense than trying to sort of build up from scratch in, in a new place, given that it's a PhD and I have a finite amount of time to get it done. Um, but also I think Palau, like I said, is really unique in that the level of biodiversity is, is kind of unmatched. And yes, the Galapagos does have a lot of really unique biodiversity that's not found elsewhere. 
but the Palau has like a higher species count. So it depends on what metrics of, of diversity you value. And because I'm asking these really big community-wide questions, I really love the complexity of, of large species numbers. Um, and for, for reference, um, I, I do some, some water sampling where you can collect DNA from the water and it can tell you all kinds of different species that are present. And so last November, we did some of that sampling in Palau. And in near shore Palau, there were just short of 400 different species that we would get from our water samples. And if you compare that to the coast of Monterey, the most that we've ever gotten out here is about 60. Wow. <laughs> so it, it's on a whole nother level. And that's something that really excites me. But that is not me saying I would not like to go to the Galapagos. So if you know someone who's looking for a marine biologist, to, you know, fiddle around in the Galapagos. I hope I'm your first call. I hope I'm the first email. <laughs> I would absolutely love to go someday. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for your questions. Indeed. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you all Wondernauts. Uh, we're going to thank our speakers at the end this evening, and we're almost there. But first, let me remind you of what's coming up. Wonderfest in the Berkeley Public Library on Thursday evening, May 11th, we'll present another Ask a Science Envoy event subtitled Poison Frogs and Quantum Chemistry. That's Thursday, May 11th. Check it out at wonderfest.org. Uh, I end tonight by offering three big thank yous. First, to you wondernauts who are here. Thanks for showing up and asking such good questions and listening so attentively. Second, to the wondernauts. Uh, oh, and of course, the Berkeley Public Library folks. Sierra and your team, thank you for being here. Thank you to Wonder Not patrons and uh, supporters. And third, most important, of course, thank you to our two speakers, Tavi Steinhardt and Sienna Tillman. How about a big American Sign Language round of applause if you don't want to turn your mic on? All right. Good night, one and all. Thanks again for being here. <laughs>